introduce uh, Rob D'Alessandro, who happens to be the Deputy Secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission. Rob is a retired Army officer and former chief of the Army's Center of Military History. He has chaired the World War I Centennial Commission, and he is the author of three books on the Great War. Today, I've asked him to tell us a little bit about the American Bo Battle Monuments Commission and the cemetery program that came about as part of the Great War. So I'd like you to continue to eat, but uh, Rob, the platform is yours. Thanks. All right. Uh, I, I can't resist saying this. I'd like to thank uh, General P for having me here and for this conference. And I've got to say that they're really going out of their way to make me feel at home back at VMI in that when I was a cadet, I remembered that at lunch I often watched many other people eat, but I didn't. <laughs> and that, that surrounded on the phrase, B Company rats out of the mess hall. Um, but I have a serious thing to talk to you about today, and I think you'll enjoy this talk, and I want to leave some time for questions, because I think it's an interesting par paradigm that uh, the United States becomes involved in. World War I is our first overseas large war. We fought other actions overseas, but not to the amount of troops that will serve and then perish in World War I. So the United States finds itself on the horns of a dilemma, and that dilemma is, what do we do with the casualties of the American Expeditionary Forces? They look to their allies. It's easy for the French. They're going to stay in country. But they look principally to the BEF, to the British. And the British immediately establishes a policy that nobody comes home. If you fall in France, you'll rest in France. It's just too expensive. It's not logistically possible for the British at this point. So we'll bury people in theater. The United States takes that into account. And they decide that they'll look to our government to give guidance to the War Department on what should be done with the fallen American service men and women. And the answer to that question is influenced by a number of things, no less than Theodore Roosevelt, who loses a son early in the conflict. And Theodore Roosevelt becomes very vocal in the American press, saying, I've always believed that the great oak should remain where it falls. And America had grown up with Quentin Roosevelt. And so this influences a lot of people, but there are other families who say, if I lose my son or daughter overseas, I want to visit them. I want to see them. And the only way I can do that is for them to come home. And so what you see the United States do is an amalgamation of these ideas. And at the end of the day, about a third, and I can answer it if we have time for questions, how it all comes to be, but about a third of our casualties remain over in Europe. And I want to stop talking there and do two things. I want to show you a film. I want to show you a film from our visitor center at Muzargan. I think it does a much more eloquent job of telling the story that follows. And then I want to break and tell you a little about our agency, the American Battle Monuments Commission. So with, with that, if we could have the film, please. I think that does a much better job than anything I could say. Um, but I do want to tell you a little about our agency. As I get slides. So the American Battle Monuments Commission is a pretty small agency as federal agencies go. But I would argue with you that we probably have the noblest mission, and we're privileged to have it, of caring for those still on duty overseas. And so we take that pretty seriously. And if you've ever been to any of our cemeteries or any of our memorials, you know we keep those in perfect, like-new condition. 
So we do that intentionally to show our commitment to our fallen overseas. So let me see if I can work the changer here, if I can be smarter than it. So you heard some of this. We're established pretty early in the game as federal agencies go, 1923. And we're established because General Pershing did not want individual units to memorialize their accomplishments overseas. What he feared was that battlefields in Europe would become miniatures of the Gettysburg battlefield. There'd be markers and monuments all over the place. There'd be no way to understand what was going on. So he wanted to centralize design and memorialization overseas. So he serves with the commission as its first chairman when he retires and remains with the commission into his death. And he's followed by, I'm not going to go through all our chairmen, but he's followed by another kind of famous guy, George C. Marshall, who takes over after him. I'm not going to belabor a lot of mission slides, but I wanted to show you this. I've underlined the two words that matter in our organization. We are an overseas organization. So we look to all America's fallen and memorials overseas. And we are a commemorative organization. We're not in the veterans benefits business. I'll talk to you about a couple of one-offs about the agency. But the truth is, we are commemorative cemeteries. They're buried out. They're finished. Here's what we do. We establish memorials overseas. We're still doing that. We build and maintain overseas cemeteries. We don't see us building any new cemeteries. It's been the United States policy following World War II to bring everybody home. So we don't foresee us being in that business. And then interestingly enough, if you're building a memorial overseas, you have to go through us if you want any help from the federal government. Here's a snapshot of our portfolio. We, of course, are thinking about World War I. We just picked up a new cemetery. I'll talk about that. We have nine World War, II cem uh, World War I cemeteries, 14 World War II, and you see the monuments. The one-offs I'm going to talk about very briefly, uh, but we have some cemeteries that don't fit the puzzle. I'll, I'll get to photos of those real quick. Probably our flagship cemetery. I wish I was a, not a World War I guy saying that, but about 3 million people a year pass through there, not quite as many as Arlington but Normandy, and this is the famous memorial at Normandy. Not our largest, by the way. A lot of people think that uh, Normandy is our largest cemetery in Europe. Muzargan is our largest in the Pacific, Manila. Manila is our largest overall, which is where all the people from MacArthur's campaign are at rest. Uh, Cambridge, I show you that to show you the alignment of the headstones. The way we keep them perfectly aligned, just in case you're interested, we get that question a lot of times, is there's a beam that runs under them. So they were all shot in, and if any of those fall over or get destroyed, tree falls on them, we can replace them immediately. So that's how they stay in alignment. Glenn Miller is memorialized at that cemetery, along with uh, um, uh, Joe Kennedy. Who's Argonne, largest in Europe. I talked about that. You saw it in the film. Manila, largest in the Pacific, over 180,000 people memorialized on the wall of the missing there alone. That's that hemisphere in the center. Henri Chappelle, I'm showing you these just to give you a feel of how these different cemeteries look. They're very different one from the other. That's where most of the people from the northern shoulder of the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge, are at Henri Chappelle. Most of our cemeteries line up with campaigns. You've heard me already allude to two of them, being the Manila one, being MacArthur's people on the Pacific push. Punch Bowl in Hawaii is the Nimitz push. This is the northern shoulder of the Ardennes. Netherlands, interesting cemetery. This talks a lot to our partnerships with the local folks. At this cemetery, every grave in the cemetery is adopted by a family, and there's a waiting list three deep for most of those graves. Pretty amazing. Sicily, Rome, that handles the campaign. Halfway through Sicily to the liberation of Rome, we have one in Tunisia that does the early stuff. Beautiful little photograph of that cemetery. Corazol, one of our one-offs. Uh, Corazol is the Panama Canal. It's still an active cemetery. We're still burying people there. A uh, little out of our business, so it's not a commemorative. And it's, it's not connected with an action, but it's everybody from the building of the Panama Canal 
to people who are expats that live in Panama today. Mexico City, Mexican-American War, that monument in the foreground there, 759 unknowns rest under that, and the knowns are on the walls to the right and the left. That's right in the heart of Mexico City. Clark's our third one off. We just got it. Um, it's the former Clark Air Base Cemetery. Interestingly enough, that was a consolidation cemetery from our work in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War. And we have people that are buried there, Civil War veterans, to OIF, OEF, because this is an in-use cemetery right now. So this is an active cemetery. So those were our three one-offs that you saw uh, that I just talked about. Our newest uh, addition, somebody mentioned it, Lafayette Escadrille, one of the organizations that came in before we entered the war. We picked this one up in April of 16. 50 flyers from the Lafayette Escadrille slash Army Air Corps are in, in a crypt in the base of that memorial. And this was the uh, turnover and centennial ceremony uh, when, we, when we took it over. But we're not just cemeteries. We're American Battle Monuments Commission. Um, I, I, was hoping that, I was hoping that Mike was still here. Mike said that the Pennsylvania Monument was the largest World War I. No, it's the largest World War I private memorial, state memorial. It is a massive memorial. But I can tell you that we just looked this up. The Chateau Thierry Memorial, to give you a piece of scale, is 20 feet shorter than the Lincoln Memorial and about, uh, about the same size on the, on the square, you know, on the, on the front. So that gives you a little bit of scale. That Monsec Memorial up in the top uh, a person that's about a little bigger than the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. So these are very, very large memorials. Pershing believed, you'll find this interesting, that if you put a memorial where people do not naturally go, so you put a memorial outside of Paris, you need to make it of such a scale that people will be compelled to go see it. So these are very large, very imposing memorials. If you've ever been at the Punch Bowl, you know that Punch Bowl is a very large memorial. And to the left and right there, those are the courts of the missing for the Pacific. That's a memorial that's interesting because it does World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And uh, if you go there, we've recently installed maps for the Vietnam campaign in that one. We have battle maps at most of our memorials. We are occasionally asked to do things that seem out of our portfolio. Uh, ABMC designed and built the National World War II Memorial in Washington. We did the Korean War Memorial in Washington, and who knows what will go on with the World War I. That's still, the jury's out on that. But after that, we turned that over to the National Park Service. It belongs to the Park Service today, though we are largely responsible for maintenance of that memorial and educational materials. So the, if you've ever been to World War II and there are kiosks down there, we operate those kiosks and, and provide the educational materials for that. You know, I, I didn't want to get into real detail, but I, I love this little slide because this shows you the reach of the agency and, and the number of people. Very small agency, but you can see we are predominantly a blue-collar agency that is Washington and Paris based. Most of our employees are in France. Very small federal presence. So I'm a federal employee. I'm the senior federal employee. We have a political employee, a, a political appointee is secretary. And, and many of our people are what we call locally engaged staff. So the people that are actually doing the work are French or Belgique or Italian, et cetera. So ABMC found itself in a little bit of a crunch a couple years ago in that many of the people who were coming to our cemeteries were still grieving. But now that generation had passed away. And one of our missions was, following Pershing's idea about the agency, was time will not dim the glory of their deeds. So we really did an about face, maybe about five years ago now, and we decided we had to get in the education business. We had to educate young people and reach out to them. And I just want to talk about this just a little bit. We opened our very first visitor center in 2007. And if you look at the list, we have opened them in short order since then. In fact, uh, in one month, we'll dedicate a new visitor center. I'm going to show you some of these at Chateau Thierry. Here's our Normandy Visitor Center. We're in the middle of doing a turn on that for the 75th. 
So we'll do, we'll, we'll refresh the exhibits there, getting ready for the 75th uh, anniversary. That's what it looks like inside. We're going to completely change that. We opened up uh, a small, we actually took over a small French visitor center at Pointe de Hoc. We're going to give that a refresh before the 75th. We have recently opened one at Sicily, Rome, which handles that uh, southern part of the Italian campaign. We have one at Cambridge that does pretty much the air war, the AAF effort in World War II. Opened up Muse Argonne for the Centennial, beautiful visitor center. You saw the film we made for that. Flanders Field opened at the same time, dealing with the Second Corps and the folks we cut to the Brits up there. And Chateau Thierry, the base of that memorial was completely empty. That's the thing you see with all the brown squares. We built that out, and that visitor center is complete, but will be dedicated Memorial Day this year. So there's been a real push on education with us. We're opening up one at Lafayette Escadrille. There's a little building the way it looks today and the way it will be rebuilt. A little idea of what that'll look like inside. That is only 20 minutes from Paris. So when you go to Paris, you must stop at Marne la Coquette and see Lafayette Escadrille. I'm yelling at you now. I want everyone in here to go see one of our places. We're opening one at Manila. It's going to be our largest visitor center, larger than Normandy. That, that site, by the way, gets more visitation than anything except Punch Bowl. That's number two site on TripAdvisor if you go to Manila. So if you're in the Pacific, please do stop at our cemetery. There's, you might have seen in that slide, we're the only green space in Manila that, that looks the same way all the way around with the buildings just encroaching on the cemetery. We will open one in Netherlands, one of our very heavily visited cemeteries in, as you saw, hopefully opening in 21. I want to do two other things, and then I'm going to shut up and open it up for questions for a few minutes and get us back on track. Visit our website, consistently rated in the top 10 websites in the United States government, abmc.gov. We have a very, very good digital newsletter. I would encourage you to sign up for that. There's our new secretary being sworn in by a handsome fellow. And uh, it, we talk about what our new initi initiatives are. So please visit our website. We have a great presence on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We pulled that video up from YouTube this morning because I really wanted to show it to you and hadn't planned on doing that until the last minute. So please visit those sites. And we have really reached out. You know, what I mentioned to you, we've gone from taking care of grieving families, and we still do that, but they're getting less and less to enlightening a new generation of Americans on the deeds of our armed forces. And it's not just the people at rest in our cemeteries. Our mission is to tell the story of American armed forces overseas. So we really have been pushing to do this. We have reached out to over 250,000 teachers, not students, teachers in schools, through programs like Normandy Institute, through programs like Bringing the Great War Home, understanding sacrifice. We work STEM things into that. These are extremely popular initiatives, and we're working to build a cadre of people out there in the school systems that will bring home the story of Americans overseas. And I, it's, it's a terrific, terrific initiative, and if you keep up with our website, you'll learn about it. We've published several books. Akimoto's Went to War is a fantastic one we've done, a prize winner. We did the National Park Service History of World War I, World War I Remembered, and we are now producing, it'll be out on 15 May, a flip book, Battlefield Guide to our World War I Battlefield. So you're driving guide, and we'll do the same thing for Normandy for the 75th. So what I'm telling you is, this is an organization that has a sacred mission, but we're not resting on our laurels we're moving forward into the 21st century. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Thank you.